Hello, hello everyone. What a privilege to be here again and to see all of you sticking with us on our energy conference and moving now into this low carbon energy summit. This is an amazing panel, might even be more amazing than yesterday's discussion with uh, Secretary Tillerson. Um, but they've got unique perspectives, and I think what they will help do is bring to life some of the concepts that Andy and Randy just introduced to us today. You have their bios, uh, they're in front of you, so I'm not going to launch into detail, but we've got Air Liquide and EDF and Centerpoint and Oxy um, and BP, so lots and lots of folks to, to uh, get their perspective on. I'm going to ask each of you in turn, where is your company? on the energy transition and how are you moving into it? And so maybe Scott, I'll just start with you since you're- Next to you? Next to me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for Our position. Yeah, thank you for having <laughs> us here. It's, uh, it's exciting to be here. So, um, you know, where's Centerpoint on this journey? So we have um, taken a number of steps to target a low carbon future or reduced carbon future. Um, we are in the midst of doing a sizable uh, exchange or reinvestment in our pipeline assets so that where we have uh, emissions, uh, methane type emissions, the replacement of pipes reduces the amount of methane emissions that are coming out of our systems. We're doing that across the nation. Um, we have uh, a generation fleet in Indiana that is predominantly coal and we're in the midst of a transition to a, uh, a uh, more of a gas and a renewable mix of, of generation, uh, again, targeted around uh, reducing the carbon footprint. Um, we have energy efficiency programs we've been doing for years uh, to you know, help reduce the amount of energy that's consumed. Um, you know, our market here locally is one where we have um, smart meters installed. All of you that are local should you know, know that we have a smart meter system in place, and that does a, that does a couple things. It allows for the, the Texas market to be able to offer new and different products. The retailers can offer different products, uh, inclusive of renewable products, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it allows us to have uh, less, less uh, transport of our own trucks that are visiting homes, right? So we've taken many trucks off the road in terms of the emissions that our, our trucks have. Uh, we've helped um, many industries uh, access uh, capital and subsidies and dollars to convert their, their warehouses and other parts of their fleet from diesel, uh, you know, for example, diesel um, forklifts or gas forklifts over to electric mm -hmm. forklifts. So those are the types of things that we've been working on and will continue to work on relative to you know, reducing the, our carbon footprint. Right, so it's a broad range and we'll get a chance to double click and go deeper on some of those particular strategies about reducing carbon, but thanks for that. Yep. Corinne with Air Liquide, what are your, where are you all in the energy transition? Okay, well, uh, thank you for, for that question. Um, at Early Kid, we see the energy transition as being a fundamental shift mm -hmm. in the society and also in our markets. Mm -hmm. um, our core business is already, is actually to, to produce and distribute industrial gases. And by that, we mean oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen. And by definition, those gases are already used by our customers mm -hmm. to improve their efficiency uh, in their different processes and also to get cleaner fuels, like for the use of hydrogen in a refining market, for example. Um, however, at the group level, uh, we want to really go forward mm -hmm. and do much more than, than our existing uh, capabilities. And uh, we have announced actually last year some major climate objectives for our organization mm -hmm. with the aim of reducing our carbon intensity by 30% between 2015 and 2025. Okay. And consequently with that, we have a certain number of programs internally that are in place, um, including uh, evaluating the carbon impact uh, of our project during the investment reviews and also setting some objectives to our senior managers. So we are very active and for us we see that as and something very important but also as an opportunity to develop up new business. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very active in the biogas activity in renewables. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and also we are developing an activity around hydrogen as a clean fuel specifically for transportation. Oh, excellent. We believe that hydrogen can play a big role right. uh, in the transition towards low carbon economy. Mm -hmm. It is one of our existing uh, core activity today mm -hmm. and we are building and investing on that. Excellent. So there's sort of two prongs to the strategy. One is around the products that you produce for others and one, the second one is around reducing the carbon intensity of your own operating footprint. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, on our side, reducing our own environmental footprint mm -hmm. uh, will be made through um, doubling the number, the, the amount of um, renewable energy that we purchase, whether it's electricity or gas, it will be increasing the efficiency of our operations by 5% uh, and towards a certain number of projects that we are launching. Great. Marianne with EDF. Yeah, so uh, in this type of aud audience, I always uh, make sure I'd be remiss if I didn't say we're Electricity de France uh, and not the Environmental Defense Fund. Um, <laughs> Good clarification. Yeah, so um, EDF has really been on the forefront of um, decarbonization. We're the largest nuclear operator in the world, and so most Americans are not aware of of the large global presence and reach that EDF has. Um, we have committed by 2030 to double the amount of renewable um, generation that we have built, own, and operate uh, to 50 gigawatts. Um, we've also um, had a strong push to diversify outside of France and to double the amount of business activities um, that we do outside of, outside of France. In North America, our strategy is very different, so we don't have the big nuclear fleet to operate around here. Um, in North America, the business model um, really goes to the source and all the way to the sink. So um, here uh, in Houston, where our North American group is headquartered, we dispatch 152 power stations out of our office, owned um, by third-party independent, so small wind, solar, batteries, uh, cogen. So really getting and helping the smaller resources interface with the ISOs and the markets all the way down to, um, we're now the fifth largest retailer in the country, so our, our commercial industrial portfolio, um, helping our end use customers uh, get green. And so as, as the markets have evolved and, and we've gone from seeing a lot of the VPPs or the virtual um, PPAs, all the way down to now really tying it into the retail agreement. So being able to take um, slices of wind farms and, and solar projects and deliver those um, to the consumers who are really very hungry for an easy to implement solution that will allow them to tell their customers, yes, this was fueled by green power. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Charlene with Oxy. Thank you, thank you very much for uh, giving us the opportunity to participate on the panel today, uh, Virginia, I appreciate that. Um, at Oxy, we believe that many technologies are needed to, um, for the world to use to reduce the carbon emissions needed uh, to reach our climate reduction goals. And, and our strategy at Occidental is consistent with that all above technology approach. Uh, we will, however, utilize and leverage our strengths and expertise in um, our, core, our core areas. For example, we are um, the global leader in CO2 enhanced oil recovery. We have billions of dollars of assets and 40 years of experience in this space. And many of you know uh, in this room that when you use CO2, um, that we use CO2 to coax out additional oil from mature oil fields. And in that process, you can store 100% of the CO2 that, uh, that you inject. When you use um, technology such as carbon capture from uh, emitting sources or direct air capture, in that process you have uh, a significant opportunity to reduce the carbon intensity of every barrel of oil you produce. Um, Oxy is aggressively pursuing CCUS projects and projects in other technology areas also. Uh, such as um, renewables and conversion technologies of taking the CO2 into uh, useful, uh, durable, long-life plastics and fuels, for example. All the projects that we have announced in the last year, or are part of uh, in, in just the last year, um, will reduce emissions uh, equivalent to about 700,000 cars per year. So you'll, in the interim, you'll see more of that to come. And in the longer term, you will see us taking those technologies and combining them in very unique and creative ways to further deepen 
um, the reductions in our carbon emissions. We have a team called Oxy Low Carbon Ventures now that is solely focused on this activity. And uh, we're, we're, very, um, we're very proud of being able to uh, do this work. Terrific, thanks. Cindy, BP. And thanks, Regina, for inviting BP to be a part of this panel. So I'll start out by quoting our, our chairman from the Financial Times just a couple weeks ago, where he, he, the leading headline is, you know, BP is embracing the energy transition. Um, we've been in the renewables business for uh, 20 plus years, um, since our beyond petroleum days. Uh, we've learned a lot. We have um, a nice portfolio of of businesses, and we continue to look for new opportunities and grow. But like Charlene said, you know, we have an all of the above strategy. So uh, for the next uh, few decades, while we, we really all want to be producing uh, energy directly from sunshine, unicorn, and rainbows right now, we're not there. So we will continue to um, work to decarbonize, uh, lower the carb decarbonize our portfolio, uh, oil and gas, work to um, reduce the carbon associated with our, our operations and our businesses. So we're, we're taking a lot of leading stands and sharing principles on methane and we are working to accredit our products through third party validation uh, as low carbon. And so we are, really continue to focus on the here and now while we build our portfolio um, through the energy transition. And Jim, I neglected to mention Hawaiian Electric. You spent a lot of years there. And as a, as a native Hawaiian who grew up in Hawaii, I'm keen to hear your thoughts. Aloha, Regina. Aloha, shaka bra. <laughs> yeah. We're going to bust out in our pidgin English before. I'm, I'm actually now a Houstonian, but I have a great deal of uh, love in my heart for Hawaii, and I'm there all the time as a board member. So Hawaii uh, has been called, and I didn't create this term, a postcard from the future, and I suspect that's why I'm with this panel today, although we might be strange bedfellows in that respect. Um, Hawaii has begun uh, a, I would say, a two-generational movement towards renewables, starting in 2008, 2009. We've moved from, in our power generation side, and bear in mind that it's a small state, um, it's an archipelago, none of them are connected, so think of them as, as microgrids, really, and I think that's why many people study our, our case in terms of the ability to bring on renewables and be sustainable. So there are some lessons learned uh, there. So one and a half million people, one of the most strategic places on earth in terms of the military. We have a four-star admiral on our board who says, I patrol 52% of the earth's surface. You better not screw this up, right? <laughs> and uh, so we, we, uh, we began in 2008 with legislation, the Clean Energy Initiative. We have very high electric prices and we have a very old fossil fleet that we're trying to replace, so we agreed never to build and never to have even an independent power producer produce power anymore uh, from fossil plants. So we began about 10 years ago now with about seven or eight percent renewable content in the electricity generation side, and we're now heading to 30 percent. We have the highest per capita um, penetration of solar rooftops. If you've been to Hawaii, Honolulu, in particular, uh, the island of Oahu, one third of our residents have solar rooftop installations, and many, many, many more now are doing um, storage, including with that. And as you know, um, prices for everything in Hawaii, given that most things are imported, are very, very high, including our electricity prices, um, because they're driven by oil, which is very high uh, priced given our, our, our location and uh, very volatile, and consumers bear that risk. So it's a matter of public policy now that we convert to renewables. As I said, we're close to 30% by the end of 2019, the highest in the nation. We were the first to adopt an RPS standard, renewable portfolio standard, of 100%. California followed us, actually. They get the attention. We actually were the first to adopt that. Frankly. If I sat here today and told you I knew exactly how we were going to do this moonshot, I think you'd know I was exaggerating. But we are very dedicated to doing that. It has milestones along the way. 
uh, 30, 50, 70, and by 2045, we are uh, going to make it. That's, that's the plan. Um, and we've had a significant grid management challenges as we head to 30%. So as we incorporate uh, more and more renewable energy, mostly solar and wind, and we have no indigenous fossil fuels on, on island, uh, and just a little bit of geothermal and a little bit of hydro. We're really doing it with solar and wind. So this is, um, this is a very interesting uh, movement that we have in Hawaii, which I think has lots of grid management, lots of uh, renewable incorporation challenges. We've renovated the entire utility regulatory model in terms of recovery uh, to disincentivize uh, the building of facilities uh, that were deleterious to the environment. So far, we've reduced carbon footprint by about 30% in 10 years. That's done two ways. We're producing less and less through fossil, and we're deactivating and decommissioning older fossil plants. So we're working at the problem uh, in both the production and the reduction uh, side of things. So we've got a very interesting uh, story. I'll just give you one or two more uh, points that will probably seem incredible to you. We have situations where in the middle of the day, 75%, call it two o'clock in the afternoon, of our daytime peak is satisfied by renewables. Nobody can really say that per se. And our engineers 10 years ago told me, can't happen, won't happen, not gonna do it. <laughs> um, and so we kept pressing the envelope uh, we worked with all of the technology providers uh, and the like, and we've gotten very, very far along as, as we go. So I'll, I'll leave you with that, and Regina, turn it back to you. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim. So you, lots of different experiences, lots of different approaches. Let me ask something that could be considered a little bit more provocative. So there is a sense, there is a, a perspective that exists in our environment that says the established providers are not gonna be the ones that get us out of this climate crisis. Because you know, we had a guest speaker yesterday, and it, one of the phrases that he left me with was, we don't know what we don't know. So it's really hard for those in established companies to think their way out of these challenges. There's an argument to be made that the only way we're gonna get out of this is through the established uh, companies. What would you say, because most of you are very large established players, what's your argument to the naysayers that say, you as the incumbents really can't get us there. And I'm gonna, Cindy's looking at me, so I guess Cindy. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go for the biggest uh, target on the panel first. So yeah, thanks Regina. I mean, I would say let's talk because uh, you know, we, we wanna stay in business. Um, speaking from BP, we understand energy. Um, we can deliver major projects. So, you know, it's one thing to develop uh, a technology, to apply it, but when you look at the, uh, putting it in at scale, a full value chain, multi-billion dollar capital projects, a lot of the, the large companies have been doing that for, for decades and we know, know how to do that. I think the, one of the big messages we learned from, uh, from our, somewhat humbling beyond petroleum days is that we can't do it alone. We need to collaborate. We need people's ideas, the innovators, the new, new thoughts. That's what we're trying to do through our BP ventures is collaborate with people who are creating the new possibilities in energy. But we want to go hand in hand, work with all of you, with them to progress. But I think Bring the ideas on. We know how to operate and execute, and we can be a we can play a big role in the transition. Well, I was going to go to you, Scott, because I even read on your website as I was preparing for another panel on Tuesday. It's true that you've been in business for 150 years. Did I remember that correctly? So talk about established. What's your what would you say? 150 years. Fortunately, I haven't been there the whole time. <laughs> um, look, I would say I would say let's talk as well. But I think the answer is is you have to have both. Right? You have to have both because there is no silver bullet to this. I'm a huge believer that there is a, there's a portfolio of solutions and that the technology and the improvements that are made by both startups as well as existing players are collectively what's going to drive us to a lower carbon future. 
Um, we're constantly in the state of energy transition. It's been our history forever. We've always been transitioning from one mode of energy to another, driven by a number of factors. And I think it's important that you know, we continue to uh, talk about all the factors that are in play when you're making decisions around uh, change and around what to do in terms of uh, new fuels and delivery. And that is, we've got to, we, we know we want to address the environment. We're all very much aligned with that. But we need systems that are reliable, that people can bank on, industry, commerce, they require reliable systems. We need safe systems. And we need, uh, we need an energy delivery system or an energy ecosystem that is affordable so that uh, homeowners can continue to afford to do what they need to at their homes. Um, industry and business can be competitive locally, nationally, and globally. We've got to balance all these things, and they all have to be there. And it, it's a, to me, this is, a, this is an argument of the power of and. It's not picking one and saying, we're going to do this right. no matter what, because there, there needs to be a thoughtful um, and practical transition. But I think the, the conversation would be, yes, we're aligned on wanting to do this. Let's talk about how we each do our part to make this happen. Corinne, looks like you have something you want to say. Yeah, I think this is a very, very good question. Um, Thank you. In Air Liquide, well, it's a very important yeah, question. It is very say. important. In Air Liquide, we've started to really look at hydrogen and the fuel cell technology mm -hmm. uh, to, produce, uh, to produce electricity as one way to decarbonize. And what we've learned throughout those years is that the challenges that we are talking about here when we talk about transitioning towards a low carbon economy are so massive that it will take everybody right. to be on board. Um, our chairman, Benoit Potier, has actually taken a lead in this, in this aspect by uh, being the founder of the Hergen Council. The Hergen Council is an industry group, CEO group, that has been created during the World Economic Forum of 2017. So that group is dedicated to uh, really develop a roadmap for hydrogen to become, uh, I would say, one of the key solutions out there. It regroups now 53 companies mm -hmm. that are partner of that right. council. And what we learned through that is that indeed, it will take both the established companies because they are the ones that have the current infrastructure, they have the investment capabilities, they have the expertise, the competencies. Mm -hmm. It takes also uh, the startups because you are exploring new fields, whether it's in terms of business model or in technology. And you need to have, we work for example with a startup in the retail hydrogen market in California called First Element. And you need those guys because they have the energy, they have the agility, right. the speed. And you need also the academic world on board. Mm -hmm. I was at uh, MIT this past Monday attending okay. a conference on hydrogen and it was also their first conference on hydrogen, for example. Right. And, and you can do that on, on many topics. But again, yeah, mm -hmm. there are several angles to, to this. The technology aspect, the business model, the investment, competencies, expertise. So it will take really indeed. No, I, I totally agree. It's going to take all of us yeah. working together. But I think there are certain stakeholders that don't buy into that. So when we are together as an energy community, we drink all that same Kool-Aid. And we talk amongst ourselves that, that that's what we need. But I don't think that the folks that are outside of this room necessarily agree with that. Mm -hmm. Marianne wants yeah. to make a point. No, I am. Um, yesterday morning uh, was thinking about this, this panel, and I read, I you know, had the Wall Street Journal, which is kind of the main course, and then the USA Today, which I kind of feel like is dessert. Uh, and front page, above the fold, um, the, the headline was, energy sources are changing. And the very first sentence, and I quote, the energy landscape changes so fast, even the experts are having trouble keeping up. Mm -hmm. And the article went on to talk about, in big, in bold, coal is over. Mm -hmm. Second bullet, natural gas is almost over, renewables are cheap, and batteries work. And I started thinking about how, exactly. um, you know, what, what our gen stack and what we thought 10 years ago, um, I pulled out an old strategy session, we were talking about importing LNG, 
right. 10 years ago. Right. Uh, then you start thinking about how the renewables, and I, I agree with Jim, the naysayer said it can't be done. It's just, you know, there's the, the physics isn't going to work. Um, but smart people can solve some really complicated problems. And so to your point, I think the incumbents who embrace change and eyes wide open, and there, there are some big oil, um, some traditional utilities who are really doing that. They're embracing that the world as we knew it the last 10 years is gonna look very different 10 years from now. Um, so to the extent that you can create a culture that is nimble and entrepreneurial and help incentivize your employees to, to find solutions where traditionally you might say it's just too hard. In, in France, they move nuclear assets up and down for ancillary services. We would never do that in the United wow. States. Yeah. Um, but it can be done if, if you put in the resources and, mm -hmm. and you hire the right people and you create a culture that embraces what that innovation and that disruption to transform yourself. Yeah, so Charlene, I'm interested in your perspective because Vicky, your CEO, has is, is gotten very public with carbon capture, right? And, and, and I like the message a lot because it's about taking carbon out of the atmosphere. Mimi, I think you're even investing in technologies that will do that, not just about reducing your current emissions, but actually taking it out and reusing it, repurposing it. But some would say that's a big oil answer, right? That's a fossil fuel, um, so more of a, a it's maybe rooted in the past kind of an answer. So what are your thoughts when, you, when you're facing into some of the, the conversations that you're having at Oxy? Sure, um, and you have to, I think you have to really know who you are as a company, what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. And you also have to know what your goals and ambitions are to be able to figure out how to get there. And, if, and then, so you identify what you need from, that you don't have internally. And um, that's why our low carbon ventures team has a specific technology group who are, uh, who are looking at a variety of different technologies to help us not only use CCS, but other technologies to convert CO2 uh, for, to useful products, um, that kind of thing. And it's, it's through that work where we have um, identified the need to partner with people like uh, NetPower, Carbon Engineering, uh, wide energy and others to be able to attain our goals of uh, our aspiration of carbon neutrality. So um, I would also say you need the support of the organization to be able to go through that transition and the, the, or our organization fully embraces this change. We have so, from our board to mm -hmm. our CEO who is very vocal about it, to vocal. the people in the, um, the, to the people all through the organization. And so it's not just the low carbon ventures team that is working on this, but now everyone in the organization is thinking about how do we lower our emissions in this process, in that process, what technologies do we need, what efforts do we need in this space, and those ideas and, and are being implemented. And it's amazing when everybody gets aligned and on board with such a um, good aspiration, uh, what, what the results that can come out of that. But to me, the key is not to pick a winner or a loser. So no. Jim, I'll close with you. Hawaii picked renewables. Right. And it's gonna be very challenging. I've heard Connie Lau speak, your CEO, where she says there's literally no other land mass available to develop renewable generation assets to meet that objective. That's, so that's tell absolutely. us how that works. Yeah, correct. I mean, we don't go back 150 years, Scott. We're, we're, <laughs> we're heading to 130. And uh, so actually Thomas Edison himself was the one who showed our king at the time, a, a kingdom till 1959, how to produce electricity. Uh, actually in the island. So we go way back. We're very hidebound. And this cultural change that a few have referred to is very significant, right? About eight or 10 years ago, we had to decide not only to bet this way, but also to make sure that the people in the company who are responsible for important tasks were either on this bus or off this bus. Many, many left the bus who really couldn't embrace uh, these kinds of technologies and uh, support the diversification that we we now have with renewables. So it took a significant cultural change right through the junior engineers all the way through the board, including the executives who are now tied to environmental and sustainable goals. I think you have to have that sort of cultural as well as financial incentive change uh, there. And also to uh, support what was said, I think it is like an investment problem, it is a question of diversification. 
and uh, we've been pushing that uh, for the last 10 years steadily. Uh, we are now getting bids for solar plus storage at eight to 12 cents a kilowatt hour, a third of what we got them at 10 years ago. So there, this is an incredible march, an incredible change, and it's starting to really uh, pay dividends. Costs for consumers are, are, are going down. Uh, our investor base is, is quite happy. Everybody um, has in the company has rallied around this, or frankly, they shouldn't be there. That's, it's as simple as that. Great, great transition. So let's, let's just take a few minutes, and we have six, so I'm conscious of time and making sure that everyone gets a chance to um, share their perspectives. But let's double click on a couple of the technologies that we actually haven't really touched on. Storage, you just mentioned, Jim. Mm -hmm. So Scott, storage, what kinds, of what kinds of tactics are you seeing around storage, and how do you see that aspect of the all of the above strategy evolving? Yeah. Look, I think storage has a uh, place uh, given the capabilities it has today. I think the capabilities with respect to storage will continue to change, mm -hmm. and so you'll be able to use them for different things. Um, depending on how much load you're trying to manage mm -hmm. through the use of storage, it can be uh, short term, it can be um, something that's more grid stabilization oriented. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what today's batteries don't have, depending on load, is kind of a long duration supply, mm -hmm. right? So that becomes an issue around reliability and certainty. Uh, but it is impressive to see how the technology has changed. I think one of the things we, we definitely want to keep in mind is that, you know, storage can be used as a way to harness renewables when renewables are um, operating. You know, when they're operating, you can, you can store that but there's you know nothing in there that is a there's no new there's no new energy in there right it had to have been energy that was produced um, at another time right uh, I think I think the markets are very different we have very different markets around uh, the nation and around the globe in terms of how they can be used and whether or not there's local support through subsidies or whether the local markets um, incentivize or allow you to use it so for example here in Texas, um, utilities cannot own generation or cannot own storage, uh, even though it could be useful for us as a grid stabilization tool. Oh, okay. We're not allowed to. Um, it's part of the deregulation that occurred years ago. Uh, storage is considered generation and utilities cannot own generation. So I think as we understand the technology and the capability here locally, there will be more dialogue about whether those rules should change and if so, how should they change so that all the players in the, uh, in the market, the retailers, the generators, and the utilities can truly use tools that are helpful for what they need them to be doing, right? right? So we've got, there's, there's some transition, there's still some uh, issues to be um, unpacked and, and discovered. Uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a real potential here, but I do wanna say, I, I, think, I think storage has a specific use. I don't think it's the solution. Okay, no, that's a really pr great perspective. Marianne, what about nuclear? I mean, that one's relatively controversial, um, but it's a great source of carbon-free generation, especially baseload in the U.S. And then I had the privilege of touring the Vogel plant construction site, right? The only new nuclear build in the U.S. that Southern Company is uh, sponsoring as well as some others. What's your view of nuclear within the all of the above strategy? Yeah, so I think nuclear is a, it's a, it's a, um, and it's an important base load resource here in North America. And to the extent we can learn from what happened in Germany, you know, where they, they quickly retired those nuke plants and had to turn coal facilities on to make up the lack of generation capacity, I think it's very important, you know, one, safety. Um, so with EDF, again, being large nuclear owner operator in, in Europe and Asia, um, it's really important that, that you have safe reliable, efficient operations around those nuclear assets. And we are building um, Hinkley Point in, in the UK and partnering um, with the government there to get that new nuclear facility online. Um, in North America, you know, EDF, when they came into the US markets back in 2008, you know, we had high hopes of being able to help develop some new nuclear assets here in North America. Um, the shale gas revolution changed that. Um, those low gas prices that, that really made it very difficult to justify those upfront costs that, that are required to develop um, nuclear. 
But I do think nuclear has to be part of the conversation, at least through this transition period in the US. Um, I do think that you know, when we look at you know, what happens if, and you mentioned earlier, picking winners and losers, right. very regional um, you know, mixes. And, and when you look at what New York has done um, versus what we've done here in Texas, it's a very different approach to, to right. how those nuclear assets compete in the markets. Right. Let's talk about transport, the electrification of transport as well as hydrogen as a mode of transport. Corinne, what are your thoughts about how hydrogen will, will make its way into the transportation value chain? Well, what we see is that clearly the transportation market is undergoing a major transformation mm -hmm. and we can expect more to come in the years uh, future. So obviously a lot of people talk about the autonomous vehicle, right. but yes, electric battery vehicles and hydrogen vehicles. Transportation actually accounts for 40% of the carbon emission globally. Mm -hmm. So it's a major segment. And what we see is uh, uh, cities, municipalities, states, Mm -hmm. uh, governments looking now at transportation after addressing the industry mm -hmm. as a way to really reduce um, carbon emission. Um, we see more regulations coming up uh, requesting uh, uh, all actors involved to put on the market uh, vehicles that have zero emission, like for example here in the US in California. Mm -hmm. uh, but we see that uh, all across the, the globe. Uh, we see many actors like uh, Toyota, Honda, Hyundai uh, developing hydrogen vehicles and they are now fully commercial. You can buy them on the market. So uh, it's the Toyota Mirai, the Honda Clarity and uh, Hyundai has even uh, launched earlier in January an SUV based on hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So with hydrogen and and the fuel cell on board of the vehicle, basically the only exhaust that you have from that car is water. So mm -hmm. no particle emission, no NOx, no SOx, no noise, no carbon. Basically that's, that's the principle. So it's very attractive. People very often compare hydrogen vehicles to uh, electric vehicles, but the reality is that both technologies we have a place. Uh, hydrogen is much more uh, convenient for longer distance and heavier vehicles. Now, in Air Liquide, we're fully engaged in supporting this transition and uh, the transformation of the, the transportation market uh, in different geographies that are pushing forward on that, in Japan, in South Korea, in China, and here in the US, we're actively engaged in California, in the Northeast mm -hmm. as well of the US, we are investing actually over $200 million uh, now in a brand new production capability mm -hmm. for renewable hydrogen for the California market. There are already uh, 7,000 vehicles that are fully operational mm -hmm. on hydrogen and that are already purchased by people like you and me. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we see that growing. We invest also in all of the steps of being able to produce renewable hydrogen in many different technologies. We are also investing um, a 20 megawatt electrolyzer unit in Bécancourt, Canada to fit the Northeast market mm -hmm. and that will be fed by hydropower. So basically what we see and what we are engaging is really aligning all of the value chain and being there at every step. Yeah, super, thanks for that. And I agree with you that I don't see it being an, a Betamax, VHS, one's going to win. It, I think it is both have a role to play in the transportation. What about electrification and, and providing those charge points? Jim, do you want to yeah, provide some input? Um, here, also, there, sorry, there's cards on your table. If you have a question, please write it down, raise your hand, and they'll, they can bring it forward. Go ahead, Jim, sorry. Here again, I think we're a microcosm that is worth watching. Um, we, as a utility, uh, we can, unlike Texas, Scott, we can invest in storage. What we have decided to do as a corporate strategy is let others invest in storage because we've already seen some losers and we've seen some winners. And that's not the kind of capital our utility commission wants us to put at risk in terms of this movement. Storage is probably where some of the other renewable technologies of generation were 10 years ago. I suspect we're, we're going to see dramatic changes in the cost structure, the same way that we've seen a one-third um, 
production cost with solar panels and, and wind, I think we'll see that kind of significant cost structure change. And, and we certainly want to take advantage of that on, on behalf of our consumers, but we're not an investor in that technology. We need to stay very nimble and let other people with their uh, equity and technology take that risk. We're a perfect place for EV. Uh, EVs. We are um, a place where you don't, you can't get range anxiety uh, by definition. <laughs> you'll, you'll get you wet. You fall into the ocean. <laughs> you'll get wet before you get range anxiety. So, so um, we have a perfect uh, opportunity here, and the car manufacturers have noticed that. So they're probably uh, next to California, of course, which is the huge market. Uh, we're sort of on their radar screen, and we're doing a lot collaboratively with everybody in the industry who manufactures batteries and, and cars. Um, we have very significant storage facilities in Hawaii. We just bought 200 megawatts of capacity, um, and that is significant for a grid like ours, that it's about 2,500 megawatts of total capacity. So think about that, eight or nine percent, just in one RFP. And uh, the utility is investing very significantly in fast charging stations, right? We, we need to make sure that consumers have that capability. We also are working with bus manufacturers, uh, the, the folks who do the rental car fleets, the government facilities, and we are actually working out arrangements, I, I can't be specific today, where we actually would transfer the batteries that are used in transportation to the power grid which is an interesting dynamic because we're all concerned with how do we um, get rid of these things after a certain amount of useful life. So we actually have a symbiosis that, that I think that, that, that can work here. So uh, again, I think you can look at um, the utilities uh, website, look at the roadmap for electrification of transportation and you'll see a, a fantastic uh, plan, which will have many applications around the country. Excellent. Let's shift gears. We've got about 20 minutes left, so a couple more questions that I want to uh, pose to our panel. Let's get back to the fact that we're imagining what is Houston's role and Houston's future in driving a lower carbon economy. And let's also talk about how does the industry get its messaging aligned, because regulators, Policymakers, different stakeholders, they all have different points of view. And I, I think, you know, back to we're the incumbents and they may not paint us with the, with the nicest brush. So, Scott, maybe starting with you, what do we need to do in Houston to start aligning our messaging and what would that message be? So, I think it depends on, you know, what issue you happen to be, you know, dealing with as it pertains to, you know, a low carbon future. But I'll give you an example of where I think we've. Uh, been successful in moving forward, and that is, you know, when you think about electric transportation, we were just on the subject of electric transportation. It, it is, it's a complex issue. There's an ecosystem of players that are involved, right? right? Because you have, uh, you've got suppliers, you've got the city, you've got um, certainly us, uh, you've got consumers, um, you've got, uh, you know, building permitting issues to consider. There's so many things to consider right. with respect to this that You've got to form coalitions. You've got to form these natural groups of individuals who all have a stake in the issue. Mm -hmm. Come together and agree on, if you agree on the objective, right, what you're trying to accomplish, then I think you can begin to have dialogue with the different people, the different parties, about what different roles need to be and what the big challenges are. Mm -hmm. So we now have a coalition in the city of players who have all agreed that electric transportation is something we would like to support. Um, it's good for the city. It's, you know, Houston's a non-attainment city, so electric transportation is, is good for the region from that standpoint. Uh, but we also want to be able to address the things that we know are the biggest challenges, like uh, consumer understanding around um, uh, maintenance and around range anxiety. Um, and the other thing that I, I think is fundamentally going to drive this, and I think electric transportation is coming and is growing, uh, I think it's going to be the uh, competitiveness in a uh, in an, like an unsubsidized way of the the new mode of transportation versus the existing mm -hmm. uh, you'll have early adopters and we see them today who are interested in the technology or just very aligned to a cause who will drive these things 
But for mass adoption to occur, mm -hmm. uh, we've got to get to where people can make rational economic decisions and they're comfortable with it. So I think as these, as cars, electric vehicles continue to come down in cost and they have performance features and capabilities that are aligned with what consumers are want, I think that's what's really gonna drive. So we need to understand what, where, when it's coming, how it's coming, what we need to do as a larger ecosystem and we need to work together. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just, you can't do it alone. Some of these things are so complicated and right. they're so societal in nature yeah. that you have to just pull the parties together to talk about it. Right. Well, Cindy, you've been spending a lot of time in D.C. and trying to manage some of these coalitions. Well, how would you answer the question? Okay, so I think um, Houston is the energy capital of the world, and we want to stay that way. <laughs> the other kind of cool thing, I'm a native Texan. We're in Texas. Texas is one of those places you can just get stuff done, where I think it's much easier to align many of the players and listen to each other and collaborate, as, as Scott was describing. So um, I think we have great technologies, we have great minds, we have a lot of research, venturing, um, projects, pilots going on. We, we have a lot to work with. I think our challenge is, is sort of telling our story, uh, getting our messaging out, and, and making this you know, look as attractive a city for energy in the 21st century as it, as it has been historically. So, and, and I know many of you, Brett, I'm sorry, you know, I, I think Houston needs to, to take a grand challenge and own it. Like, you know, we are going to be, we will be a net, net zero carbon city by 2040, 2035. And we've, we've got the capabilities to do it. We've, we've got carbon capture, the US is one of the carbon capture use and storage. Um, it's, it's the leader in the US. We've got companies with a lot of know-how uh, sitting all, all around me. Um, we've got two big active projects between Petronova and NetPower. Let's, let's be the carbon capture use and storage uh, source. We've got resources uh, both do, on- Do we have the political will with the city leadership to make that declaration, do you think? Well, I think we need to all get together and, and talk about this. How could right. we do this? But you know, we've got industrial sources, we've got great Mm -hmm. EOR opportunities and rocks. Mm -hmm. Let's let's get her done. You know, <laughs> Marianne, what yeah. you add? And I, Charlene. I was I was going to pile on. You know, I met I met Cindy. We're uh, both on the University of Houston Energy Advisory Board, mm -hmm. and I think for Houston, one of the things we really need to focus on is being able to attract and retain talent. Mm -hmm. right. So working with our universities and and part of what we do on this U of H Advisory Board is really talk about what do we need in our employees, what are, what's missing, and how can we make sure that we're training this next uh, you know, round of employees um, effectively. So I was at Dynegy when Texas deregulated. I traded ERCOT. We had three zones. The price changed every 15 minutes. The first year, we had 100,000 pricing points. We managed that all on spreadsheets because you could. Um, our, our FTR traders, so our virtual traders, in just Texas, <coughs> 26 million pricing points. Oh. You, you can't do that on a spreadsheet. You need to have um, people who can deal with data, data scientists, and we're competing against Silicon Valley. Right. So how do we make energy fun and exciting and attract key talent to, that, that, that they're like, I, I need to go to Houston because that's the energy capital of the world. Yep. Charlene? Yeah, I'm gonna elaborate a, a lot on what uh, Cindy said um, because it's so important. I think uh, Houston has a great opportunity to be a leader in the world in many carbon reduction technologies. And I'll specifically talk about CCUS. Um, we both are members of the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative. It's a group of 13 oil and gas companies representing about 30% of the oil production in the world. And one of our key initiatives is how to advance and facilitate marketplaces around carbon capture utilization and storage. There is no better place than the Gulf of Mexico, the greater Houston area, or Houston. Uh, we have uh, substantial sequest sequestration potential along the Gulf Coast, in the Gulf Coast, or pipelining it to the Permian Basin. You also have EOR here on the Gulf Coast, but and you also have some of the largest emissions uh, concentration anywhere else in the world. So you've got the source and you've got the sinks. And you also have the engineering and capability. Um, so the Oil and Gas Climate Initiative is looking at 
hubs, networks, if you will, to help facilitate these uh, CCUS marketplace across the globe. And Houston is one of, going to be one of our focal points. And so we're already talking um, with um, many different uh, organizations in the Houston area on how, how can we aspire to achieve that goal because it will take tremendous collaboration and support from, from many sectors and stakeholders um, uh, in, in the region from uh, environmental groups uh, political groups and advocacy groups, non-governmental organizations, academia, foundations, uh, other emitters. You know, so this marketplace would, would allow all emitting sectors to participate in, not just OGCI members, uh, member companies. So it's to facilitate a marketplace, yeah. a commercially sustainable long-term marketplace for CCUS. Okay. So at the risk of being provocative, mm -hmm. If we say we need to focus on CCUS, is that not picking a winner or a loser in a similar fashion as we did with renewables? Let me correct. I didn't. I said the OGCI group is focusing on CCU. On, uh, okay. One of our initiatives is to focus on CCUS. Mm -hmm. We are not saying that other technologies should not be okay. moved forward. We are the an all of the above approach. Okay. So me, all of the above. Let right. me just clarify that. Okay. We think we agree, or I, our company agrees with the uh, assessment from the United Nations uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that it's going to take many, many technologies mm -hmm. moving rapidly to reach our global emissions reduction targets in the United States. Yeah, so, I mean, ultimately, we need to get to the two degree C scenario and an all of the above way, right? Isn't that our message? Yes. Here's a, mess here's a, a question from the audience, and Corinne, I think it's um, uh, targeted more toward you. When you look at global investment around propulsion, how do you see that lining up hydrogen versus electric? Is it 50-50, 80-20? We're looking at the global investment environment. Well, this is a very good question. Um, yes, uh, very often people uh, oppose uh, electric vehicle to, well, but by the way, hydrogen vehicles are electric vehicles. So very often people oppose battery to hydrogen. What we see is that both technologies have a place in the market. Hydrogen allows to have a longer uh, driving distance uh, over 400 miles versus battery that is a more shorter distance. Um, and there are a lot of developments right now on the use of hydrogen for uh, heavy duty trucks. So it's not only light duty vehicle that we're talking about, it's heavy duty trucks, it's also maritime, and mm -hmm. it's also the aviation right. industry. Right. Um, so the wide range of hydrogen, I would say, is wider than, than maybe battery. And I would expect to see more investment coming in hydrogen, maybe in the coming years, than what we've seen so far. Uh, it's true that from a battery uh, vehicle standpoint, well, Tesla and Elon Musk, mm -hmm. yeah, is, uh, I would say, right. personality really uh, demonstrated that actually it was feasible. So right. thank him because he, he made it a success. Right. Um, but yes, there will be room for both technologies to, to really move forward. And just to complement actually on, on the place of Houston and mm -hmm. the leadership of Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, I totally agree with all what has been said. I would add one thing. I think that people don't realize, or it's not as visible, that actually Texas is the first state of the US with the largest renewable production, mm -hmm. with right. yeah. wind power, right. with yeah. electricity power. Mm -hmm. And maybe that from an image standpoint, Texas is still seen as an oil state, but now it's a renewable right. <laughs> energy state now with the numbers that we have today, and my right. colleague yeah. agree yeah. with that. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the infrastructure and the high technology and the competencies, the expertise, I mean, there is everything for Texas and for Houston to be at the forefront worldwide on yeah. this topic. And, and it will provide economic opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. What we see is that we have certain area, like for example, the port of Houston, Today, its growth is limited because it's an unattainment area, right? Mm. And, and transportation in terms of NOx and SOx emission uh, really impacts the growth of the port of Houston. So if we start here in Texas to have some very visible high-scale projects 
to demonstrate that it's feasible, that the technology is there, and that it's economically feasible, I think we will be able to really shift things around and, and get moving. It's however, yeah. However, I, I also uh, totally recognize that the changes that we're talking are, are significant in terms right. of infrastructure mm -hmm. and that require also some support in terms of policies and, right. and authorities. So. Yeah, good, very tangible. Thanks, Corinne. Okay, final words, 60 seconds or less, starting with Jim. I think uh, the safe place to be is what we've decided. Um, you know, we're pro-consumer, we're pro-environment, and of course we operate with private capital the way everyone on this panel does. So we have to respect each of those uh, stakeholders, but every time decision-making takes place in any of the areas that we talked about, again, we put the consumer first, the environment right up there, and then of course we have to make sure that we're financially stable and have the, uh, uh, the capital market support for everything we do. So that's the reality of the business that we're in, and that's the philosophy that we follow. So faster transition, bring it on. Um, we've been in business 110 years, and we're looking, I thought that was a long time, but uh, we're looking <laughs> forward to, to the next 110, mm -hmm. and uh, we realize that uh, things are evolving. We've survived through flexibility and resilience, and we'll continue to do that. We realize uh, this is, an all of the above strategy, it's a transition, it's a race to renewables, I mean, sorry, it's a race to reduce emissions, and we'll embrace renewables, but the big challenge we're taking at our company is reducing carbon as well. So, I guess final word, Houston, let's do it. Yes. <laughs> let's become the, uh, uh, you know, the low carbon energy capital of the world. I like it. I like it. Uh, Oxy will be 100, I think, uh, next year, uh, if I remember correctly. So we're almost a 100-year-old company, and we have gone through many transitions. Um, I think we were in the pencil market at one time and the <laughs> meatpacking business, too, somewhere over, over time. So we have transformed our company uh, many times over. And so um, it, it does take an awareness of who you are and knowing what your goals are and uh, being able to reach out and collaborate with others. And I think we've done a... Uh, a really good job with that and we're looking forward to um, some of the initiatives that I mentioned today of continuing to work on them and, and so, uh, seeing the greater success of multiple organizations and stakeholders in this arena. EDF, I'm feeling like the baby on the group. We're only <laughs> 70 years old. Um, so I, I first, I, I want to thank the Center for Houston's Future. I think as an industry, we have a branding problem. Um, there is a lot of great work that is being done in this industry, this segment, and um, the more we can do to bring that to the front page and, and show how much is happening, and it's a very exciting, energetic place um, to be a part of and to work towards. Uh, I think, um, you know, Brett and team, this, this was a great opportunity to help us one step closer to, to improving our brand. Thanks, Marianne. I agree. I think that this type of initiative gathering so many people and seeing so much interest in the low-carbon economy is really the first step towards uh, changing mm -hmm. things. Um, I've been traveling around in the past few weeks developing projects in the West Coast and in the Northeast as well, and I would love to be able to come back to my management saying, okay, we have projects in Texas in now. Texas, yeah. So I'd say a few things. One is a message to take away is that Houston is interested and beyond interested, committed to reducing its carbon footprint. I think mm -hmm. the players around here in the energy sector understand the value and want to and are taking actions to reduce carbon footprint. I think that's the first thing. Second thing is that the, uh, there's an all of the above approach that needs to be kept in mind because it's not just about reducing your footprint, it's about balancing a number of aspects I mentioned earlier. You've got to balance uh, decarbonization, with cost, with reliability, and with safety. Those things all have to be managed, particularly in this economy that is so driven by business and industry. We have to look at all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we, if we accept that and we look at that, if we talk about reducing our carbon footprint versus eliminating it, I think it allows us to take steps forward. We can be active, we, can, we have plans, we have things to do uh, that we can, um, where we can be successful in reducing our carbon footprint, very noticeably reducing the carbon footprint. So we're committed to it. 
it takes all the above in balance and, uh, and let's focus on the steps that we can take which will lead to carbon reduction. Terrific, well said. So a group of senior executives from very established incumbents all articulating the goals of reducing carbon and doing it together collaboratively and making Houston the center of that equation. So please join me in a warm thank you and welcome uh, to this panel. Re Regina, thank you.